Thank you, Levi. Let's see. Okay, well, these are my disclosures, and the most relevant disclosure here is to Araxes, a company uh, that I helped co-found. And um, what I'd like to do is uh, tell you about a drug that just last month entered the clinic, uh, and I'd like to tell you about how the last sort of six, eight years of work uh, led to the discovery of that drug and why I think it's an important um, drug in our arsenal to fight cancer. So I, I know that many of you don't work in cancer, and so to, the, today's session has probably been quite an alphabet soup of, of, of targets that might contribute to cancer. And if you look on this slide, uh, the two highlighted proteins, KRAS and BRAF, represent together about 30% of cancers because each of these are very, very highly frequently mutated. But they've had very different trajectories in terms of our ability to drug them and treat patients that have those two different um, mutational drivers. So for KRAS, uh, this was actually the first human oncogene to be discovered in 1983, and since that time, there have been no uh, drugs that have been approved for treating specifically KRAS-driven tumors. And I'll focus on why that has been, uh, but to contrast that with the uh, kinase uh, mutations in BRAF, they were discovered in 2002, and then the first drug was approved for treatment of those mutant tumors in 2011. So what explains the vast difference uh, in difficulty of going after KRAS compared to protein kinase mutations? One thing is, is that KRAS is a very small protein that really does not have any what we call druggable pockets. These are imaginations in the protein that let us bind a molecule into that pocket and change the function of the protein. Now, many of you might be saying, well, both of these proteins bind a substrate, a nucleotide, GTP in the case of KRAS and ATP in the case of BRAF, so there's a pocket. Why don't we just go after that? Well, the challenge is, is that KRAS holds on to its small molecule substrate with 20 picomolar affinity compared to kinases with 20 micromolar affinity, and that's where we attack kinases. But if we attack kinases, if we attacked GTPases in that way, we would have to be a million-fold better at drug discovery to attack uh, KRAS in that same way. So we really had to go out of the box and think of a different way to attack uh, this, this KRAS. So um, this uh, is a slide that just introduces you to the biochemistry and the cycle of, of KRAS. And I, what I want you to focus on is the middle, and that is that KRAS binds to GTP and is in an on conformation. And to the right, it can then recruit downstream proteins like PI3 kinase or BRAF and turn these, uh, these protein pathways on. Now, since RAS holds on to its nucleotides so tightly, it has a very complicated way of losing the off nucleotide GDP and putting the on nucleotide GTP in its place. And that's the bottom cycle uh, going from 9 o'clock to 6 o'clock. That's the guanine exchange factor that strips out the nucleotide. Cancers are driven to evolve mutations that allow them to preserve the GTP state of KRAS in uh, much longer time frames. And the way uh, those mutations work is they prevent the top 12 o'clock protein, the GTPase activating complex, from working, which is to accelerate hydrolysis. If we zoom in to that interface between the gap and the RAS, on the RAS on the right side, you'll see that there are two amino acids, glycine 12 and glycine 13, and they line the interface between the gap now shown in blue, and any mutation to glycine 12 will push that arginine away and decrease the hydrolytic cap capacity of that complex. And that's why that glycine 12 is the single most frequently mutated activating mutation in all of cancers. Now, because that steric occlusion can work in any number of ways, there is an opportunity that different residues become have appeared in different of the cancer subtypes. And so this is a slide of the 12 most uh, deadly cancers from 2014. And in blue are the uh, levels of KRAS mutations that appear in each of those cancer types. And you'll notice in pancreatic cancer, there is a preponderance of the aspartate, glycine 12 to aspartate mutation, but also glycine 12 to valine, and a small amount of glycine 12 to cysteine. If we go to colon cancer, that distribution changes a little bit, and we see a little more cysteine and a little less aspartate. If we look at lung cancer, the smoking-induced cancers in KRAS evolve a, 
a glycine 12 to cysteine as the dominant mutation. Now, the diversity of those amino acids really provides a chemical opportunity that we exploited. Because cysteine is a rare amino acid, because it's nucleophilic and reactive, we can design a drug that will home in and find that cysteine on that KRAS that is somatically mutated and target just that protein. Now, this irreversible bond is, of, of drugs is usually considered a liability, and really the pharmaceutical industries have shied away from it. Uh, but I want to stress to you that actually this is not because we don't have drugs that work in a covalent fashion already, all the way back to aspirin, which we've heard about in the morning session, and penicillin and other drugs. Uh, that are big blockbusters such as pump inhibitors and, and Plavix, et cetera, are covalent drugs even though they are not really uh, advertised as sort of that being their defining feature. But we decided to use this strategy that's been exemplified by these drugs and go after the, the mutant that is on KRAS, which is that cysteine. So with uh, this short amount of time, I can't tell you really how we uh, went and started from the very beginnings of a weak inhibitor and optimized the molecule, but this crystal structure of our first drug bound to KRAS really exemplifies uh, the point I wanted to make. So on the right is the nucleotide, and now that, as I told you, is held onto by KRAS very tightly. And in yellow, you'll see the cysteine amino acid, and you'll see a drug bound attached to that cysteine going into a pocket. And what I told you at the beginning is true, that at the beginning there was no real good pockets in KRAS, but this is a drug that creates its own pocket, and the whole protein shields around that to make a druggable pocket. You can see on the left, it's a nice cavity. So how did we optimize that? We took this uh, beginning starting point, and it's a very flexible molecule. It has many points of, of rotation, and the protein itself is flexible, so this is not compatible with an optimal drug. So over about 700 molecules that the drug company that we started uh, um, explored, they found this one key in particular, very, very important chemotype that showed very good uh, potency against the G12C mutant. And we can put this into a panel of cell lines that have various cancer drivers, and the drug will only kill the cancers that have the G12C mutation. Those are the ones in color. And when we put it into an animal, it shrinks tumors that are driven by the G12C tumor, by the mutation. So we think that this drug has a very, very good chance of having a very, very uh, beneficial treatment in patients that are selected for that G12 mutation. And it's an analog of that molecule on the left uh, that uh, many, many, about four companies are now starting to put uh, very similar analogs into patients. And we hope in the next couple of years to see how they respond. Thank you.